Well, very much uh, welcome, uh, Daniel Levy, President of the U.S. Middle East Project, to us here at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. We've had an opportunity to listen to you this afternoon, but perhaps uh, for our YouTube audience, you could share some of your thoughts. We've uh, hardly had the um, ink dried on on Resolution 2334 on settlements before Israel uh, today, I believe, uh, decided on uh, uh, settlements to retroactively make them legal. What are your thoughts on this and what are the consequences for the peace process? Well, I think this bill that has re been referred to alternatively as a legalization bill, as legalized theft, um, which has basically said that settlements built, even if it's proven to be on private Palestinian land, can retroactively uh, be okayed under Israeli law. Of course, this is a violation of international law, all of the settlements. Um, but Israeli law has drawn a distinction between acts that it considers legal and illegal. And even this act considered illegal until now under Israeli law uh, would now be okay. It is something that Prime Minister Netanyahu himself, when this was first put forward, in the Israeli parliament late last year described as so problematic that it could end up having Israel taken to the ICC in The Hague. Subsequently, he's changed his position and has supported the bill. The expectation in Israel is that the Supreme Court will not allow the bill to stand. But I think the important thing is the Israeli parliament passed this legislation and Clearly their expectation is that the repercussions will be minimal and that they can handle the international repercussions. I fear they may be right. I don't think that should be the case because I think the absence of accountability, the ability to sustain Israeli impunity is precisely what has brought us to this moment. Mm. And what is key in characterizing this moment is the perception that any Israeli act will now be met with American at best indifference or even support. Donald Trump has uh, talked a lot about uh, his deal-making capacities and uh, put forward uh, the thought that he can finally make the big peace deal. What do you think about that? If that is to be the case, then I think the learning curve for the Trump administration on this issue will have to be a steep one. Um, the starting point is that if you're going to make a deal, it's a deal between two parties. And those parties are the Israelis and the Palestinians and therefore it will have to be a mutually acceptable deal. This is not a deal for America to back everything Israel says. Trump appeared to understand that early on in the primary season when he spoke about America needing to be a neutral arbiter, a neutral broker if there is to be peace. Subsequently, both in the campaign and in the transition period and in the very early days of this Trump administration, we've seen nothing to suggest that that neutral broker role uh, will be pursued and everything to suggest that we will be in a qualitatively new place when it comes to America endorsing Israeli violations of international law and acts that render impossible uh, peace and a two-state solution. However, it's early days. Um, that dynamic could shift. For it to shift, there would have to be a coming to terms with the realities of this situation, the realities of how problematic Israeli policies are regarding the Palestinians, the realities of the Palestinian legitimate aspiration for basic rights, freedoms, dignity, and ultimately full enfranchisement. But more than that, there would have to be an American willingness to use its leverage with Israel in ways that have never been done before. That seems to me very unlikely. 
and you asked about the peace process, in actual fact, there's no golden era to look back on, really. The peace process has been uh, a cover for ever more problematic Israeli imposition of control over the Palestinians for quite some time. Um, so there, there is a need for a radically different approach, which is unlikely to emanate from Washington, D.C., unfortunately to the detriment of both Palestinians and Israelis, actually. What in your mind is actually happening within Israeli society that has made the country move even further away from the notional idea that there would be a two-state solution? Well, I, I think the best way to understand this is the gradual culmination of things that could have been anticipated already early after 1967, perhaps earlier, but let's stick with the 67 focus for now. Israel maintains Now it's more problematic, but a relatively robust internal democracy. Um, that wasn't the case in the early years regarding the Palestinian citizens. They were under a military government. That changed. And even if there are elements of structural discrimination against the Palestinians inside Israel, Palestinian citizens of Israel, which there are, and even if there is provocation, there is still a democracy. At the same time, Israel has been maintaining an undemocratic role as an occupying power, disenfranchising and imposing very ugly limitations on Palestinian freedoms in the territories for 50 years now. Many people understood already in 1967 that if you tried to maintain one set of rules on one side of a line that was being erased all the time and another set of rules on another side of the line that could not be sustainable. And I think what we've seen is over the years, as the occupation policies have been ever more crushing of any prospect of peace with the Palestinians, that gap has been closed by Israel itself becoming less democratic in order to live with, justify, and manage the occupation. Which, you know, at one level all sounds very academic. What it actually translates into today is a set of Israeli policies that do not have universal consensus. I think it's important to acknowledge that but a set of Israeli policies that look much more like an ethno-nationalist, illiberal democracy than the kind of liberal democratic model that Israel claims to have aspired to and that many of Israel's supporters continue to attribute uh, mistakenly to Israel. And in many respects, that ethno-nationalist model is being replicated and adopted in parts of Europe and perhaps now in certain quarters in Washington, D.C. as well. Sort of defining our era. Uh, what about the Palestinian side? They've been very divided, and uh, what do you think one can expect in terms of response from their side to the evolutions of today? Well, I think that the, the Palestinian political class is particularly badly positioned to effectively respond because there is this division which is debilitating for any real possibility of building an effective Palestinian strategy. You have the national movement divided, you have Gaza under Hamas governance, limited Hamas governance, the West Bank in the small islands of Palestinian limited self-governance under Fatah, um, the Palestinian national movement uh, does not embrace uh, all the factions. There have not been elections either at the national or local uh, or even municipal level um, for far too long. So the democratic deficit is there on the Palestinian side. And more importantly, they just don't have a strategy for how to confront this and seem too often 
to be looking inwards unless there is a Palestinian ability to come up with a new approach recognizing the self-defeating nature of sticking with the old model that has been emptied of the things that were useful in advancing peace and has been used now as, as a, a vehicle for continued Israeli control. Absence coming up with a strategy that is an alternative, I think it's going to be very difficult to shift the situation. If there is the ability to unify, um, to go back and get a mandate from their people, to mobilize their people, to come up with a strategy that disrupts and challenges the status quo, all of which is extremely difficult but not impossible, then I actually think that this moment of Israeli overreach, of an Israeli lurch towards more egregious policies, potentially with ongoing backing from America, this actually could be an opportunity for the Palestinians, so, and therefore for peace for everyone. So renewed strategy on the Palestinian side and a reconfirmation of a recommitment to liberal values on the Israeli side and some shift in the response by the international community. What can Sweden do? Well, I mean, just on that recommitment to liberal values, I do think that, that, there, that, that any kind of values, moral dimension to the argument has been far too absent in mainstream Israeli politics for far too long. Uh, and so that will take a, a significant turning of a corner, which one would like to see, but is not happening yet. I think that there is far too much willingness on the side of international actors to be part of the furniture, be part of the problem by maintaining the status quo. Uh, I think the current Swedish government, but also previous Swedish governments, to their credit, uh, have been more willing to challenge that status quo, to look for openings um, that could actually drag us out of uh, this rut, this impasse that serves no one that we are in, that serves no one ultimately. Um, I think the move of recognition of Palestine was the right thing. I think it should have been followed by others. I think we will reach a moment when it is followed by others and Sweden will be seen to have, have led on this issue. I think Sweden at the Security Council, Sweden within the EU and Sweden bilaterally, uh, I don't want to suggest everything is on Sweden's shoulders, but Sweden can continue to speak truth to the parties, mobilize like-minded states to try and maintain maximum adherence to international law, to what can be done on a humanitarian level, and to trying to push for a smarter politics by the international community that was partly brought to play in the French initiative the Security Council resolution that you referred to earlier um, has to be reported on every three months. I think it would be useful uh, for Sweden and other Security Council members to make sure that is done in a serious, comprehensive, robust way. Uh, and I think in the absence of European unity, one will have to build coalitions of the willing inside the EU who are ready to work with the Palestinians on unity and on a new strategy, who are ready to hold Israel accountable, who are ready to work with pragmatic and moderate forces inside Israel. And I think it is important to recognize that the kinds of initiatives Sweden and others have taken are actually in the interests of a better future, not only for Palestinians, but for Israelis as well, because I think that point is too often forgotten. And beyond. Daniel Levy, thank you very much. Welcome back. Thank you. Nice to be here.